generation Texan from Dallas. Um, I went, oh good, some more Texas, <laughs> woohoo. I went to an HBCU, I graduated from Howard University. At, it, oh no, I'm not gonna do that one. <laughs> but I do know, yes. Anyway, um, and I was the coordinator of the very first Earth Day at Howard. Not the first day at Howard, but the first Earth Day in the year when it was. Oh. Because, well, nobody else was doing it, mostly. <laughs> and Dennis Hayes, whose idea it was to have Earth Day, even though he gave great credit to Gaylord Nelson, who was a senator at the time, mm -hmm. former governor from Wisconsin. But um, Dennis had graduated in a class of some people, I know several of them, Al Gore, Dennis, um, um, Daniel, well anyway, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> We're on a first name basis, go, well, we, yeah. We really are, yeah. yeah. Daniel McGraw, sometimes I have to wait a second for it to show up. But they had all been classmates. Uh, I think one of them was the president of the class. Anyway, but they realized we weren't doing it. And I, and I said last night when we were on the boat, one of the things is you may not know what's wrong, but you do know something in your, your, the fiber of your body. When a river is on fire, when the Cuyahoga was burning, I don't care where you're from or what you're doing, that is just clearly wrong and not normal. And so that's the era in which I entered this. So I was an intern at EPA. I think the agency was maybe nine, 12 months old in Bill Ruckel's house, the first director's office. There were five of us. It, it, was, it was quite a way to start an environmental career, but the environmental legacy in my life, I think extends much more to additionally, you know, I remember reading Rachel Carson as a little kid. And I also remember seeing the way in which, and it was Dow, I don't know much about who the people were, but the way the press maligned her, mm -hmm. they brought up the fact that she wasn't a real woman because she hadn't had a child yet. Oh, no, no they, go, go look up in the newspapers. I mean, they called her everything but a, a, a child of God. <laughs> and it was to undermine her expertise, she had no authority to be, to be doing this. But I often say, if you drink water and you breathe air, you have all the authority you ever need to have an opinion and to voice it on these environmental issues because they are essential to life. And that's what we know. Now, I have, I have several quotes. I like a lot of quotes. Let's get them. One, and Kathy already knows which one I'm gonna use right now. Uh, for about 35 or 40 years now, I've been saying, it's, oh yeah, because it was two weeks ago, it was Mother's Day, right? Something like that, close. Um, and I kept thinking, we always wax eloquently and, and you know, how wonderful it is to be a mother. And m since my son's 44th birthday is tomorrow, I really agree with that. It is wonderful. I mean, my gift has been to be, the, and I'm not doing the commencement speech at the conservative uh, Catholic College in Kansas. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that, but. That's my next gig. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's time for us to mother earth and to make mother a verb. So you think about that. Mm -hmm. We wax on about it, how much we care about mother nature. And you used a, a reference earlier. And remember, it's not nice to fool mother nature was the margarine commercial, uh, <laughs> since we're using <clears throat> older commercials. But it's. <laughs> But it is time for us to, it's time for us to look and to respect and to take seriously our responsibility to the, see I, I tried to write on a couple of things because it's been such a full rich day, I wasn't sure I was gonna remember everything right. that I wanted to bring up. But in addition to it's time to Mother Earth, it's also we as, hum, as humans have failed in the most basic fundamental task that we have and that's to live sustainably on Earth. I actually don't even talk about the climate crisis anymore. The, the specifics of that are what we have to address and to deal with because we failed to live sustainably on Earth. But there are communities, there are places where for 200 generations, people have lived on the same land and have been able to do it in what we now officially call circularity because they were attuned to and, and understood and, and 
without, a, without an arrogance or hubris, but rather understand we are part of nature, not apart from nature. All right, this is an issue that I've covered quite a bit in the podcast. You think of environmental justice and your own experiences with that. And so what advice would you give, let's say, nonprofits? Because what's actually exciting about the adaptation space is they give a lot of thought to environmental justice issues, climate justice issues, but it does it, a lot of it's just rhetoric. And it's like they're still figuring out how, what does it mean, the applied nature of it? What kind of advice would you give nonprofits that are tr struggling, that they want to do the right thing there, but how you really integrate it in a tangible way? I'm not quite clear on the way in which you just asked that because okay. many of, and I think Melissa might still be here, many of the environmental justice organizations, I mean, I, one of my sheroes is Gro Harlem Brundtland, mm -hmm. who three times was prime minister in Norway, but she was a physician, but it was out of, um, of a failure, and I don't remember all of the details of it in terms of her son, that was the catalyst that got her involved in addressing a wrong. You have the Ginki, the Ginko Society in Japan, when the women, uh, Blue Sky, were, were, they wanted to be good citizens, they wanted to be good financial participants and agents, but they also had all these children who were having vast amounts of pulmonary disease. The water on the western shores of Japan was kind of yellow, green, blue, and not, not blue, yellow, greenish. You know, and that was what was the, what were the pollutants that we were, you will find. You can go around the world. You will find so many women. You had the Kayapo, uh, the uh, the Chikpo women at the uh, base of the Himalayas, who literally went around. Thinking, or one of my dearest friends in the world, Wangai Mathai, who in 2004 was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, and founded the Green Belt Movement for planting trees, place after place. And yeah, I'm talking about being biased pro-womanist, or whatever you want to call it, feminist, because you, you know something is wrong. And people keep telling you in your ear, no, you don't have enough knowledge. You don't have enough degrees. You don't have enough this. But you still know it's wrong. And maybe, OK, I know the one I want to talk about. <laughs> so and we, condensing a lot of my, because my stories, you know. So, Bennett Johnson was leaving the Senate and he wanted to create a business. Well, I'll give him the benefit of that. I want to create a business. So he was from Louisiana and he wanted to start LES, Louisiana Energy Services. I think calling it less was a better name uh, because it was much less. He was going to voluntarily bury in Louisiana the spent uranium rods of Japanese and French nuclear power material. And I said, but in Louisiana, they don't even bury their dead in the ground because the water table level is just too high. So we're now going to bury something that no human has ever successfully buried for 5,000 years in a place where it shouldn't be buried there to begin with. So that was not a great plan. But he, and then they decided they would go to, and this is where we get into what we call formerly environmental justice. They pick a community where they're going to do this, unincorporated. Uh, often African-American, black, Native American, indigenous people's communities, Latinos, you know, anybody that they think you can either, my words, hoodwink, convince, ignore, or run over. That's just my, the history tracks that I'm right. Okay. <laughs> so, so the, the ministerial council is going to hold a forum, and the, a really nice guy, not nearly as nice as you, but a really nice guy, <laughs> you know, is going to moderate the forum. Okay. And then we're going to have people testify and talk about it. Because, of course, they're going to do jobs, because they always promise jobs. Nobody ever, rarely does anyone track to see if the people who live in that community qualify for the jobs. And I did, of course. And there were two jobs of that whole list, and they were janitorial jobs, that they had anyone in the community who qualified. But you can figure that. You don't even need to be a math major like I was to figure out that was a hoax. Okay. So... We've, it's a hot, hot night. I've never been so hot in my life. And you're in the room where it's, it was a movie set. You know, the, the, the one light is hanging down, the light bulb on the string, where the room is cinder blocks, and everybody's sweating because it's hot as all get out. Anyway, so all these people have talked, and finally the moderator turns to Sister Malone, Uma Malone. I, it, I'm going to get Jill's kill box. And so he said, well, Sister Malone, do you have anything to say? Now, 
you all may not have been to a lot of sessions with a lot of black women. I have. But she's sitting down and she starts spreading out her skirt. When a black woman smooths out her skirt before she stands up, she's going to tell you something. <laughs> and I hope you're going to listen. So anyway, <laughs> she smooths out her skirt, you know, and then she stands up. And bless her heart, she's five by five, so she's not any taller when she stands up really than she was when she was sitting down. <laughs> But she said the following. She said, look, I don't have an MD. I don't have a PhD. I don't have no Ds. <laughs> but I know right from wrong. This is wrong. Well, Fannie Lou Hamer, I got a list of people that I have known, known of, or have relatives in my family who have worked with. I know right from wrong. When people know right from wrong, they can't just ignore that. So anyway. OK, I love that answer. <laughs> and I think the phrasing of my question was just not good. So we're going to move on. But that was fantastic. And we're, as we're kind of wrapping up here, yeah. besides Justin, what makes you optimistic about the future? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Yes. Day. Because I've done a few interviews before. And I used to be the president of River Network. And we were doing for Black History Month uh, a long interview over my life, and you know what. The, and so at the end, she said, "What gives you hope?" And I thought this needs to be a good answer, you know. And I said, uh, "Because at, it was about two years ago, and so a lot of less than happy things were going on, and decisions, and it just was. It didn't look good, okay. you know. Okay." Okay. And I said, well, you know, it is true. Because I used to dance. I, 23 years I did classical ballet, and I used to teach little children movement and dance. That's joyful. And I said, if you are really, and you know, it's just if you're drained and drenched, go spend an afternoon with a three year old. Or for, I'm, seri I'm deadly serious. No thanks. Because one of the gifts, I remember when my daughter discovered the grass was not this green amorphous thing, but there were blades, and she grabbed some of it in her hand, and she picked it up, and she showed it to me, and she had just, dis she had discovered grass. <laughs> and that is the point. If you spend that afternoon with that young person, you realize you have a direct responsibility to make sure that their water is clean and pure, that their air is pure, that their opportunity is real, that you are going to be supporting them, that you understand what life-giving work it is to be responsible for that next and subsequent generations, because their moment is coming. And, and while we're here and in, in place and in power, and in responsibility, we better damn well be doing everything we can to make sure that each and every time there are no throwaway people, no throwaway communities, no industry. You know, they say black lives matter, and then somebody wants to say all lives matter. Well, of course, all lives matter, but it's that we now realize we need to act like we realize it and not do what's not right. I could have said that better. But anyway, this century has got to be the justice century. And I th one of the things I love about being on the Waterfront Alliance board is with all of the wonderful technical work and, 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 and advanced and, and, and important work they're doing, but there's a mentality to spiritually understand that centering justice in the heart of all that work is really important. Now, I remember the one thing I said I was going to, by the way, we act. The first New York City environmental justice report came out on April 5th. And I think Peggy Shepard, who's a dear friend, and we act was co-founded by Peggy and Bernice Miller Travis um, 35 years ago. They have tried for a long time to have a New York City environmental justice report. It's a mere 273 pages, which I highly recommend. It does have a 20 page executive summary. But it, it, it is a mapping tool to look at not just where things have been put, not just the complaints, but what we need to do, could do, should do, and I hope will do in order to make it better. I think on that note, we have to wrap things up. Diane, this is the most free form interview I've ever done in my <laughs> life. 
but I think people have enjoyed it. I have. It's been fantastic. But I think we're going to have uh, um, Courtney wrap things up. Okay. But we're going to leave the stage. And this has been a pleasure chatting with you. And I I've, agree. It's, just, it's a joy hearing your story. Yeah, so thanks. thank you. Thanks.